I would like to make it absolutely clear right at the beginning. I didn't gain a single second from my talk, so I'm not, I definitely won't pay, so. So, so I really love this poster, and uh, so I copied it from the video. And I think actually I will touch upon most of the phrases you can see on this poster. So actually this is my title slide, actually possibly properly written the title because the off has been left off from the abstract book. So actually I would like to start pretty far away. I would like to talk about uh, cellular decision making. So making decisions is as fundamental for cells as for our everyday life. And uh, uh, in order to make a decision, of course, the cell has to be able to detect some signals, and the decision making can be illustrated very clearly, I think, on a signal response curve. And uh, uh, if we take the simplest scenario, which, uh, which possibly definitely the simplest possible scenario, that as a consequence of decision making, the physiological state is changing only in respect of a single protein, which is a very naive scenario, but I think it's very easy to explain. Uh, then actually we have to emphasize that actually proteins are very dynamic units because they are usually continu continuously synthesized and degraded and their synthesis can be regulated for example by a transcription factor and their degradation can be also regulated for example in eukaryotic cells at least by ubiquitin ligases. So if, if the signal for example, activates a transcription factor, you can get a, sign a sigmoid signal response curve. Possibly I should have to emphasize that this curve is a steady state response, not a temporal response. So it can happen that below a certain threshold, the protein level won't change, and the protein level will change only if the signal exceeds a certain threshold, then the protein steady state level will increase. And this gives you a switch-like response. However, there are certain concerns with these solutions. We know very well that cells are operating in a noisy environment and, and their intracellular milieu is also noisy. So if, for example, the signal is actually, the signal level is fluctuating, the cell can very easily change its mind. So if the signal drops below the threshold, the protein level decreases again and the, and the cell will change its mind. So as a consequence, I call this switch a reversible switch or the po possibly the most popular phrase is the buzzer because it operates just like this laser pointer. The signal is on until I press it. As soon as I remove my finger, the signal goes away, or just like the doorbell. So it's a reversible switch. So possibly cells are not very keen, uh, uh, need some kind of other solution to have decision making. And one proper solution in certain uh, cases is, the bi uh, is, is a bistable switch which also comes with a threshold, so the signal has to reach a particular value in order to turn on the, the response, the protein level, to become high. However, in this, under these circumstances, even if the signal actually gets reduced after the transition, the cell doesn't return to the pre-transition state because in the bistable system, you have alternative steady states. So for the same signal strength, you have an off state and an on state. So even if the signal gets reduced a little bit, the cell can keep the, the high level of the protein and the, and the response at high levels. So therefore, it's called bistable switch, which works like a latching mechanism. Fundamental question is that what kind of uh, network structure you require to get a bistable response. Actually, it's much simpler than you think. So if we take the same scenario that the signal activates the transcription factor, what you need for a bistable response, some kind of positive circuits in the system. For example, that the protein activates also its own transcription factor, which is a clear-cut positive feedback loop, or another positive circuit, which is a double negative feedback loop, that the protein actually shuts off its own degradation. So if you shut off your own degradation, so you inhibit your own death, you will live forever, trust me, that's actually true. Anyway, it can also happen, because it happens very often in protein interaction networks, that proteins have inhibitors, which in stoichiometric inhibitors, and if the protein uh, downregulates its own inhibitor, that's also a double negative feedback loop. Of course, you don't need all of them, but actually they act synergetically in order to generate uh, a bistable response. So in the bistable response, you have two different thresholds. You have an on threshold when you turn on the response, 
and uh, you have an off threshold where actually you lose the response. Uh, actually, they come with two different scenarios. So what is shown here is the typical toggle switch. So if you reduce the signal back to close to zero, actually the response disappears, so the system can toggle between the on and off state. However, it can, come become, it can become absolutely irreversible. If you actually pull this threshold to the negative regime, then it becomes an absolutely irreversible switch when the signal can turn on the response, and it, even if the signal disappears, it doesn't turn off. So these are stable steady states where the system can rest for a long period of time. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is a, something else I have to say. So this is an S-shaped response because the signal promotes the, the production of the protein. However, there is a mirror picture. If the signal, for example, turns on uh, the degradation machinery, for example, activates the ubiquitin ligase, instead of S, you get a Z-shaped response. Because if the signal is weak, the protein level is high, it activates its own transcription factor, shuts off the ubiquitin ligase, downregulates its own inhibitor, and the protein level is high. Once the signal reaches a critical threshold and turns on the ubiquitin ligase, everything collapses and you go to the low protein level state. So this is a Z-shaped response, and this is fundamental to understand my talk. So and in order to, for you to remember, I want to use this Zorro uh, thing. So just, you, you can forget about S-shaped response. Just remember the letter Z, and that's, then you will understand everything. So it's a fundamental question, what is this dashed segment of the curve. In order to illustrate this, finally I came to Barcelona, so I can, I can use this slide in the right context. So whenever you have two stable states, actually the, the theory tells you, dynamical system theory tells you that you must always have an unstable steady state between them. Because the stable steady state corresponds to the valleys, which are actually represented by the two rivers running on north and south of the Pyrenees. And if you have two stable states, there must be always a mountain ridge, which is the Pyrenees in this case, where the system cannot stay forever too much because any noise will push it out. So you shouldn't tell this to the people living in Andorra. But anyway, just, <laughs> just, this is just between us. So, so the, the top of the Pyrenees represents the unstable steady state, which separates the two attraction zones of the, of the stable states. Okay, so this is again, uh, this is the ca uh, caricature of the, of the bistable system. So now I want to go to the eukaryotic cell cycle. I'm pretty sure that most of the people in the audience are familiar with this one. Anyway, very briefly, the cell cycle starts with the cell in G1 phase with unreplicated DNA. Uh, which, uh, uh, and the cell undergoes DNA replication during S phase of the cell cycle. Then, actually, after a pause, which is called G2 phase, not uh, illustrated here, uh, the cell enters into metaphase uh, of mitosis when actually chromosomes uh, align uh, on the metaphase plate and seg the cell segregates the sister chromatids, uh, finishes mitosis, and finally divides. So during this uh, pro during this process, during progression through the cell, like, cell cycle, always in a clockwise uh, fashion, actually cells undergo many transitions when they make fundamental decisions. So the first decision what cells make is at the beginning of the cell cycle, early G1 phase, called, in, called start in lower eukaryotes or restriction point for higher eukaryotes. The cell has to decide whether it wants to proliferate or not. Uh, later on, once it decides to proliferate, there is a transition where it makes a decision to start DNA replication. This is called the G1S transition. Once DNA replication is completed, enters into G2 phase and makes a decision to enter into mitosis, which is called the G2M transition. Once in mitosis, it has to decide whether it's, it's timely to segregate sister chromatids, which m depends on whether all the chromosomes are bioriented on the mitotic spindle. And this, is, uh, this decision is made at the meta to anaphase transition. And finally, there is the decision to leave mitosis, which is called mitotic exit. Uh, so progression through the cell cycle is co uh, controlled by a very complicated genetically uh, controlled biochemical regulatory system, and the most important components are the CDK1 cycling complexes, and among them the CDK1 cycling B is possibly the most prominent one. 
Actually, the rule is pretty, pretty simple. The activity of this complex in all eukaryotes, as far as we know, fluctuates during the cell cycle. So there are two, two fundamental phases. So in G1 phase of the cell cycle, the activity of this complex is relatively low, practically zero, although I have to tell you there is no zero in biology. That's a fundamental rule. So actually, it's a small number. Yeah? So it's very close to zero. The activity usually appears at the G1S transition, increases continuously, um, it depends on the species. Uh, it reaches its maximal level uh, in, in metaphase of mitosis, and then the cycling subunit gets degraded by a ubiquitin ligase, as you will see later, and drops back to zero level, okay? So the network is highly dynamic, so the cycling subunit is continuously uh, the cycling subunit is synthesized. Of course, the CDK1 also, but that's relatively at constant level. The degradation of the cycling subunit is controlled by a ubiquitin ligase called NFase promoting complex or cyclosome, which eliminates the activity of the complex. There is a stoichiometric inhibitor, which uh, has different names in each species. This is just the typical biological thing. So I just use a generic name, cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor CKI, which is also a dynamic protein. It's synthesized and degraded, and so on and so on. So anyway, if you, get the, if you want to get the long story short, this is how I think the network is controlled. So the CDK1 cyclin B complex, uh, here I'm using most of the time uh, the budding is nomenclature. The CDK1 cyclin B complex uh, activates the transcription factor for cyclin B, which is a huge complex. One component is NDD1, but it's not very important. It shuts, off its, uh, it shuts off its own degradation because it inhibits one form of APC, which is CDH1, and also in a redundant way downregulates its stoichiometric inhibitor because it inhibits the transcription factor of the inhibitor, which is called Y5, and promotes the degradation of the inhibitor. So these are redundant double negative feedbacks, and this is a positive feedback loop, that's a double negative feedback loop, and this is redundant double negative feedback because this has negative effect on the, on the kinase activity. However, promoting the degradation of something is a negative effect, so this is a double negative feedback loop, and that's also a double negative feedback loop. So actually, possibly you realize this picture resembles what I said. It potentiates the system to be bistable. Uh, for that reason, uh, not for that reason, I don't know the talk by heart, I gave this long time ago, anyway. <laughs> What I forgot to mention, actually, a bistable switch resembles uh, the, the light switch on the, on the wall. You need two different opposite forces to turn back and forth. Once you, you are thinking about the light switch, it's obvious to understand that actually you need helper molecules in a bistable switch to turn back and forth. And because... So, this, uh, so if this is a bistable switch, it requires helper molecules to turn it on and off. And one of the helper molecules is, uh, I use a generic name, starter kinase, which helps the system to turn on, to get out from the red regime to the green regime to get CDK1 cycling B activity. So this is what I call starter kinase, which does many things, among others, actually starts to promote the degradation of the stoichiometric inhibitor because it's insensitive to the inhibitor. Uh, once the system turned on, so the light switch is in one direction, actually you need the opposite signal to turn it back to the original state, and this is the job of exit proteins. And one of the exit protein in the cell site control network is another form of APC, which is normally called APC CDC20, which also promotes the degradation of the cyclins, but you will see later it's completely differently regulated. So anyway, now I want to draw a complicated picture, which has been drawn and published long, long time ago in year 2000 with my long-term collaborator with John Tyson. So here I will assume the following that during the cell cycle, actually these two helper molecules never ever coexist. This is a simplifying assumption. It's not necessary to make it, but it allows us to draw the picture on a two-dimensional piece of paper. If you drop this assumption, then you have to draw a three-dimensional picture, and possibly you are happy to avoid that. Yeah? So anyway, so what I will assume, that on the left-hand side of the diagram, the, the starter kinase activity is increasing in an unusual way from right to left, 
but there is no exit protein. On the right hand side, exactly the opposite, the exit protein is increasing from left to right as normal, but there is no starter kinase. So this is a simplifying assumption, but actually I tell you the truth, it's not very far away from the, from the reality. So actually if you make this assumption and you take into account the network what I showed to you, we claimed that actually you get a huge Z. You, you must get a huge bistable system. And what is actually very important in this bistability, there is an intermediate middle stage, which, which is a neutral state when there is no helper around, there is no starter kinase and no exit proteins, and the cell could be in principle in G1 phase without CDK cycling B activity, or it could be in metaphase of mitosis. And it's impossible to tell where is it, because actually what determines is history of the system, because this is a hysteresis loop. It depends on the history of the system, which helper molecule was present last time, which state is the system. Uh, of course, the test of the pudding is eating, so what I want to talk uh, in the... Uh, in the next few minutes is an experimental test of this picture. Of course it's tested and it, should, it turned out to be true, otherwise I wouldn't give a talk about this. But anyway, uh, I would be silent. Yeah, anyway, so the left-hand side, so the picture actually claims that on the left-hand side there is a threshold in the starter kinase activity and once you pass that threshold you go to the high, kin high CDK1 cycling B state and actually, the picture claims that the G1S transition has an underlying bistable switch. So very, very briefly, because this was, uh, the test was done independently from me, but based on the model by uh, Frederick Cross at Rockefeller uh, University. So actually, what they used is a very complicated genetic background of budding yeast. So they knocked out all the starter kinases, because this is biology and bloody complicated. There are three of them used one of them up behind the galactose-inducible promoter, and they used an exit protein which was temperature sensitive. So by using a temperature sen sensitive exit protein, they could avoid that the cell visits the right-hand side of the diagram when they raise the temperature. So when the cell was on uh, glucose, there is no starter kinase, and cells accumulate before start in G1 phase of the cell cycle. Then they added galactose to the cells, so they induced the starter kinases, and they pushed cells over the threshold, presumably. Yeah? And then they uh, removed the galactose, they added raffinose or glucose back again, and you have to know that the starter kinases, which are actually CDK cycling complexes again, the cycling is a very unstable protein, so it has a very short half-life. As soon as you, you stop the production, actually the protein disappears. So the story is the following, possibly you will like it. So we start from Spain, we go to West, yeah? and then we suddenly change our mind and we move back to East. If you cross the Pyrenees, you come back to Spain, yeah? so you are happy. Yeah? However, if you, if you go a little bit further, you, you keep the, uh, the starter kinase induction, for a long, you induce them for a longer period of time, then actually the system starts to move to the north, and then you terminate the induction of the starter kinases, there is a completely different outcome. Although the starter kinases disappear because the system is equipped with awful number of positive circuits, actually the high CDK1 cycling B state becomes self-sustained, self-sustained, self-maintained. Actually, you go to France. Yeah? So at the end of the experiment, all of these cells have no starter kinases, no exit proteins, one population treated for a short period of time actually stays in G1, another population which was treated for a longer period of time, not all the cells, of course, the majority of, these, uh, of the cells in the population, actually in mitosis. So they go to France and these cells stay in, in, in Spain. Uh, so the right-hand side of the diagram actually claims that mitotic exit also has an underlying bistable switch, and this has been tested at CRUK, Lincoln's infield, uh, in my good friend's laboratory, Frank Ullman on budding yeast. Actually, it was done by a Spanish postdoc, Sandra Lopez, uh, 
uh, possibly because mitotic exit is coming back to Spain from France, and because she was staying in London, possibly she was very keen to come back to France. Actually, instead of that, I tell you the truth, she moved to Mo Norway, so, and, <laughs> which is even further to the north. And so, so it's a very, very complicated genetic background, so what they did is that they shut it off the exit protein when the whole, all the cells in the population accumulated in metaphase of mitosis, what you can see here very clearly. They had high cycling levels, no stoichiometric inhibitor, and so on. And then they induced another exit protein, so they promoted cycling degradation. And you can see by inducing the exit protein, the cycling level goes down, at least on the Western, it's almost undetectable after 50 minutes. And the short metaphase spindles, characteristic for cells in metaphase of mitosis, collapses. I should have to say that in these experiment, cells cannot do anaphase for complicated reasons. But as long as any biochemical markers concerned and cytological markers, these cells went out from mitosis uh, because mitotic phosphoproteins were dephosphorylated and the spindle collapsed. Okay? So you, you start from France, you go to the Mediterranean, you lose the cyclines, the cell goes out from mitosis, and then you shut off the exit protein. Because you suddenly go to the west, you cross the Pyrenees, you go back to, you go back to France, but you can see very clearly that this G1 marker, the stoichiometric inhibitor, which starts to accumulate, cannot stabilize itself. It, it actually disappears again because the reappearing cycling suppresses the accumulation of the stoichiometric inhibitor. Cells keep their uh, DNA content in the 2C, uh, so they don't divide, and actually you go back to metaphase of mitosis. I don't show the data, it's published anyway. If the, if the exit protein was induced for 10 minutes longer, up to 60 minutes, a completely different outcome has been observed. Actually, cells go further down, and, uh, and when the exit protein is inactivated, they go into the G1 phase. Because what happens is that the stoichiometric inhibitor, this is called SIC1 in Budingis, by the way, actually accumulates to a higher level, reaches a critical threshold, and doesn't let the cycling to reaccumulate, and stabilizes the G1 phase of the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Okay, so. Uh, but this is not the full story, so there is a fundamental bistable switch in the eukaryotic cell cycle in all organisms, I think. Actually, it's much more complicated than this one, which is regulated by helper molecules and turned on and off uh, in an alternative way. Uh, in this experiment, which I, which I showed up to this point, we always ban went back to the neutral state, to the middle of the diagram, by an external perturbation. However, the cell during the normal cycle has to go back to the neutral state because you have to realize this one helper molecule which helps one of the transition actually is inhibitory for the other transition. So after each transition, the helper molecules has to be downregulated. The helper molecules must be downregulated. And cells can do this very nicely by negative feedback loop. And these are well documented in the, in the biochemistry. So the starter kinase helps the accumulation of the CDK1 cycling B. But once the CDK1 cycling B activity appears, it says thanks to the starter kinase and kills its activity. And this happens by transcriptional downregulation of the transcription factor for this one. And this is a clear-cut uh, three-component negative feedback loop. So this is a negative effect on the starter kinase. The starter kinase has a negative effect on the stoichiometric inhibitor because it promotes its degradation, and the inhibitor has a negative effect. So negative, negative, and negative, this is a three component, three legs negative feedback loop. Exactly the same happens with the exit protein. So the activity of the exit protein depends on the CDK1 cycling B activity. So the CDK1 cycling B promotes an activity which kills it. So this is a clear-cut suicide loop. Yeah? I always tell to my students, I, mean, I, I not tell them, I mean, hang, in, suicide is very common in Hungary, but you should, never, you should forget what I'm saying. So you go to the kitchen, you turn on the gas cooker, but you don't light it, you lay down on the floor. So this is what the CDK1 cycling B does. It turns on something which kills it, yeah? the CDK1 the CDC20 APC activity. That's a clear-cut negative feedback loop. 
So for th that reason, uh, actually, cells are oscillating around this hysteresis loop, because once the starter kinase pushes the system over this threshold, and actually the CDK1 cyclin B activity appears, it represses the starter kinase, and the system goes back to the neutral state. Uh, on the other side as well, exit protein gets activated, however, the activity of the exit protein is CDK1 cyclin B dependent. Once you fall off the, the cliff here, the exit protein has to lose its activity and you go back to the neutral state. So the cell is oscillating around the hysteresis loop by negative feedbacks. However, we think that actually, <laughs> we don't think. <laughs> I'm just speaking anyway. So <laughs> I, I went too fast. Anyway, this oscillation is fundamental to, for alternation of DNA replication and mitosis because replications origins are licensed when the CDK1 cyclin B activity is negligible in G1 phase of the cell cycle. When the activity appears, it triggers DNA replication first uh, for complicated reasons. And later on, it activates the exit protein, which actually triggers chromosome segregation through securin degradation, very complicated, and promotes cyclin B degradation and pushes the system back to the origin licensing state. So this oscillation of CDK1 cyclin B is fundamental for the most important phenomena during the cell cycle, which is alternation of DNA replication and mitosis. However, uh, this picture actually gives uh, a, a wrong message because most of the eukaryotic cells during their cell cycle are not running, uh, are not behaving as free running oscillators. Uh, only early embryos are responding to their cell psych uh, machinery as a free-running oscillator. Most eukaryotic cells are st stopped in the neutral state because these are the points where the checkpoints are operating. So, for example, uh, budding yeast, but also many, many other organisms, wait in this neutral state until they become large enough, this is where the size control is operating. So the small daughter cell, which is usually uh, much smaller than its mother, uh, has a much longer G1 phase in the cell cycle, and, for, and the reason is that it waits at this point until it becomes large enough before it activates the starter kinases. Also, once cells reach this neutral state in the, in the high kinase state, they stop there, uh, because they wait until all the chromosomes get bioriented on the mitotic spindle before they start to segregate sister chromatin. This is crucial to avoid aneuploidy. And this is actually guaranteed by the mitotic checkpoint, which is also called the spindle assembly checkpoint, which is actually let the cell to continue cycling once the kinetochore uh, become under tangent. So if tangent becomes larger than zero. Actually, I have to tell you, I worried... Uh, about this here, my talks becomes really very complicated, but I try to do it. So actually, there are more bistability here. And the truth is the following, that the, the helper molecules, both the starter kinase and the APCCDC20, the exit protein, are not only regulated by negative feedback, they are also regulated by positive feedback loops. This is extremely well documented for the starter kinase. There is a uh, transcriptional positive feedback loop. Uh, it's, the picture is emerging that actually there is a double negative feedback loop to regulate the APC-CDC20 activity by the mitotic checkpoint complex, which inhibits this complex. However, the complex promotes the degradation of the mitotic checkpoint complex, but this, this is not so clear right now. So if you want to follow what I'm saying, I would ask you to turn your head uh, 90 degree to the left. So if you do so, actually you will see a Z again. And that Z comes from a positive feedback and that interaction with the, uh, with the negative feedback loop. So as I said, the CDK1 cyclin B down regulates the starter kinase. So once CDK1 cyclin B is high, the starter kinase level has to be low. However, because there is a positive feedback on the starter kinases, they can resist up to a certain threshold for this down, they can resist this down regulation. So you get a Z, and this Z gives a new bi-stability, so a stable state here, an unstable here, and what I forgot to mention here is another one. 
And this is the situation when the cell is small. And as the cell is increasing, cell size pulls this picture upward. And the stable steady state fuses together with the unstable one. And the system can fire out and do the start transition once the cell reaches the particular size. Uh, we have models uh, for this bi-stability in the, in the mitotic checkpoint, but the curve here is very complicated, so I just uh, illustrate one part of it. So the point is that one, until kinetochores are not under tension, the system has a stable steady state in metaphase, and tension generation pulls this picture up, and you lo lose this stable steady state, and the system can fire out uh, once all chromosomes be, uh, become under tension, OK? So what I didn't mention, which is the more well-established uh, bistable switch, which underlies the G2M transition. However, this is not so characteristic in the budding yeast cell cycle, but this was the first bistable model we developed with John Tyson in 1993. This is well uh, uh, proved by experiments. Uh, for example, Jim Farrell lab, this looks crazy. Anyway, this, uh, this, this took 10 years to illustrate the bistability of this uh, inhibitory phosphorylation of CDK1 cyclin B. So I don't want to talk about this much more. I want to change gears and talk about meiosis. So this is a collaboration with uh, my other friend. I'm, I'm collaborating with everybody who left Kim Naismith lab, or to, more or less. So this is another great biochemist, Wolfgang Zachary, who works at Martin Street at Ma Ma Max Planck Institute. And he is very much interested in meiosis. So me it's not very important to understand what <laughs> goes on during meiosis. There is a DNA replication, which is followed by two nuclear divisions. And what we were focusing on is the entry into the f first M phase, which is called the pro prophase metaphase transition preceding the first meiotic division. Actually, this is something pretty similar to the G2M transition. So the kinase activity in prophase is very, very low. The CDK1 cyclin B kinase activity is low. And it's very high in metaphase of, uh, of, uh, of meiosis. Uh, so prophase is very, very extended in meiosis for the following reason. Because meiosis is different from mitosis that cells are diploids and they want to recombine their chromosomes. And this recombination is triggered by very extensive double strand breaks. And actually, the cell, until the double strand breaks are repaired, doesn't want to enter into metaphase because that would have lethal consequences. So the double strand breaks, in fact, uh, induce uh, a so-called recombination checkpoint, which I abbreviate with RC. And if you look at any textbook, this is the picture what you will find for budding yeast. So the re recombination checkpoint induced by double strand breaks inhibits a master regulator, which is, of course, an, a transcription factor in meiosis, NDT80, which is responsible for the cyclin synthesis, but it's also important for the polokinase synthesis. So until double strand breaks are present, NDT80 is kept inactive, and therefore there is no polokinase, there is no cyclin B, so the cell is stuck in prophase of meiosis and cannot enter into metaphase. Uh, you will find that actually this transcription factor auto-activates itself. Its activity requires CDK1 cyclin B activity, so you can already see some positive feedback uh, loops in the network. However, what Wolfgang group has found, and we published together, that actually it looks very strange. Uh, in order to have a stable prophase arrest, cells require an active degradation machinery, which sounds uh, stupid at first. If you don't have a transcription factor, you don't make these proteins. Why on the earth you need this uh, APC activator, AMA1, which is meiosis specific? to keep this prophase arrest. I think the reason is the following. The transcription is the most noisy part of, regulator, of cellular regulatory system. The cell can never, ever be sure that for noise, this transcription factor just by noisy 
manner gets activated and these proteins get produced and get stabilized by the positive feedback loop. So in order to be safe, the cell uses an active degradation machinery to keep, to stabilize the low kinase state and to avoid cyclin B and polo accumulation. So this AMA1, which is a meiotic <coughs> regulator of APCC, promotes both polo degradation and cyclin B degradation. Actually, they have, Wolfgang Lab has found that uh, there is a double negative feedback here because once the cell enters into metaphase one, the CDK1 cyclin B shuts off this uh, APC activity, so there's a double negative feedback loop, okay? I only want to show you one piece of uh, uh, evidence from the experimental evidence from the paper. So if you, this DMC1 is a recombinase, which is absolutely essential for recombination. So if you knock it out from the cell, cells are continuously stuck, permanently stuck in prophase because they cannot repair double strand break. So if you make a DMC1 deletion, basically what you see on the Western, that NDT80 level is very, very negligible. You will see later, this is almost nothing. There is no polo kinase, there is no cyclin B. And this protein, HOP1, is phosphorylated, which is a clear indication for the checkpoint signaling. And these are synaptonamer complex proteins which are between the, uh, which are at the chromosome axis, okay? So what they did in Wolfgang's lab, they ectopically induced with estradiol polo, and they could break this prophase arrest caused by the lack of, recom uh, lack of recombinase. So the DMC1 uh, delta cell was equipped with an ectopic promoter, a polo HA tag, HA tag polo behind an ectopic promoter. After induction of polo, what you can see, the prophase arrest is broken because the HA tag polo in you activates NDT80, the native, the endogenous polo also appears, cyclin B appears, HOP1 loses phosphorylation, the synaptonamer complex uh, proteins disappear. So actually you can supplement this network, which is already quite complicated, with an extra negative effect. Look at the animation. So you induce polo, which silences the recombination checkpoint, therefore NDT80 gets activated, which actually synthesizes more polo and cyclin B. Cyclin B shuts off AMA1, and the cells breaks the prophase arrest and enters. You don't believe, James? <laughs> You look very skeptic. Uh, this, is, this is true. So actually, polo silences the recombination checkpoint. So if you, ta if you take this network, which looks uh, a little bit hopeless to understand, actually it's not so difficult, and you take into account that polo kinase activity requires CDK1 cyclin B activity as by phosphorylation, you can simplify it. We don't simplify when we model it. This is just for presentational purposes. Wolfgang hates it because he's German. He wants Mercedes-Benz, everything prepared properly. So anyway, if I call these two kinases at M phase kinases, I lump them together just for presentational purposes. Basically, this is the picture what you get, that the M phase kinases activate their own transcription and they inhibit their own degradation. That's it. So it's a positive feedback, double negative feedback. Not surprising what I'm claiming that there must be a Zorro picture, yes? How the Zorro picture looks like, this is how the Zorro picture looks like. So this is the picture for a cell which has permanent uh, double strand breaks. It has, it cannot under, uh, go further in meiosis than metaphase one because CDC20 is inactivated. And this is what the model predicts, there must be a big bistable switch, however, uh, a bistable switch, which means that prophase and metaphase are uh, alternative steady states. However, we learn from the experiment that actually the prophase state has to disappear at AMA1 level zero because we know that AMA1 is required for the, for the prophase arrest. So this is not the AMA1 activity. What we use on this diagram is the experimentally manipulable uh, things, which is the AMA1 protein level. AMA1 activity depends where in which state you are. So if you are here, then AMA1 is active. In this state, AMA1 is inactive. This is AMA1 level. And in the model, AMA1 in a Y-type cell is at, uh, at one unit. So Y-type cells, if double strand breaks are present, are happily stay in a stable steady state in Spain. 
and they never ever think even think of going into metaphase of mitosis. However, if you remove AMA1, you delete AMA1 from the cells, as we know, then cells enter into metaphase 1, and here is the Western for those experiments. So an AMA1 deleted cells with double strand break present actually breaks the prophase arrest, it activates NDT80, activates polo, and synthesizes polo and synthesizes cyclin B. Uh, the model makes the following prediction. If you take these AMA1 deleted cells, depending when you induce AMA1, and you induce an intermediate level of AMA1, you can go either to Spain or France, just like before. So if you induce AMA1 early, you will still capture cells and keep them in Spain in the prophase state. And here is the experiment. AMA1 induced, at, this is from the paper. So AMA1 induced after one hour, basically, here is the AMA1 level. You don't see any NDT80, any polo or cyclin B. However, if you induce AMA1 later during this progression, for example here, you are unable to redirect cells into prophase and you will happily end up in metaphase of meiosis 1. And here is the experiment. So this is a bistable system because at certain level of AMA1, cells can be either in the low kinase state or the high kinase state. Uh, so this is the picture uh, in, in prophase arrest for cells. How, the question is how Y type cells, act, this is polo actually, how Y type cells go into metaphase 1? They, in principle, could go by reducing AMA1 level. However, this is not what happens. So, in Y type cells, when the double strand breaks are repelled and chromosomes recombine, actually the curve changes drastically. The threshold moves to the move to the right. So the red curve becomes a blue curve and the system very smoothly goes from the low kinase state to the, to the high kinase state. Uh, of course this was a toy, but so th in the paper we are simulating all the, all the genetic backgrounds uh, what happens, what happens with, uh, with budding is during uh, uh, meiotic prophase metaphase uh, transition. So this is my conclusion slide and I make it in time. Yeah? Very impressive. Yeah? So anyway, so my conclusions are very, very simple. I want to argue that all of these transitions during the eukaryotic cell cycle, at least in lower eukaryotes, are uh, controlled by, uh, by stability, G, uh, starts G1S transition, G2M transition, and mitotic exit. This is actually still a red herring. I'm not 100% sure. It's a big question whether the same is true for higher eukaryotes. We, we, are, we are working on it. And I think this is extremely important because actually you can consider the eukaryotic cell cycle as a very simple developmental process. So the cell actually has to time and orchestrate and order things in both space and time. So I'm 100% confident that these bistable switches are extremely important for, uh, for cellular decision making, especially in development. And uh, the final slides, these are the people working in the lab right now. And these are the people who are talking to me or uh, I'm happy to collaborate with. And thanks for your attention.